Para mí es un placer poder dialogar con Teila Hakimi. Y lo primero que pensé es que el nombre es nuestra primera seña de identidad, ¿no? Cuando en el Malva nos enviaron la información de las y los escritores que participarían de la residencia de escritores allá por el 2020, antes de la pandemia, a los primeros días de marzo. Eh, me llamó mucho la atención el nombre de Teila. Dije, qué original, ¿no? Y lo primero que pensé, no se van a reír, es que por su sonoridad tan cercana podía ser la traducción al hebreo de tequila, que es la bebida del estado de Jalisco, de México. ¿no? Eh, sé que es absurdo, es un disparate, pero a veces tengo esas asociaciones un poco de niña, conservo creo que a la niña que llevo, la llevo conmigo muy bien. Eh, después me olvidé ¿no? de, de ese nombre hasta que... Teila vino acá la semana pasada y leyó un texto donde contó de dónde viene ese nombre. ¿no? Y Teila es un personaje de un escritor, Shmuel Yosef Añón, el primer israelí premiado con el Nobel de Literatura en 1966. Teila es una anciana de 104 años. La más hermosa que se hubiera visto, buena y sabia, y afable y encantadora. Hay una imagen que me gusta mucho para pensar este tipo de diálogo que estamos por comenzar y tiene que ver con las trenzas en el cabello. ¿no? Para hacer una trenza hay que dividir el cabello en tres partes. ¿no? La trenza que estamos por, por iniciar tiene como protagonista la vida de Teila, la escritura y la lectura. Son tres partes sin las que no podríamos hacer esta trenza. Así que vamos a empezar. La primera pregunta tiene que ver con un cuento que se llama Infancia de naranjas. La narradora dice lo siguiente. Cuando era niña me costaba mucho diferenciar los sueños de la realidad. No sabía trazar la línea entre lo que pasaba en el día a día y lo que pasaba en los sueños, especialmente si eran buenos. Si toda escritura tiene algo de autobiográfico, como quizás tenga este cuento, ¿por qué esa niña que le costaba tanto diferenciar los sueños de la realidad eligió estudiar ingeniería mecánica y no literatura, filosofía o alguna carrera del ámbito de las ciencias sociales? Bueno, primero, regarding the tequila, I must say that when I, uh visit other places and people have a problem to pronounce my name, I normally say it's like tequila only with the H instead of the, the Q, so. Um, and well, you know, it's, it's a good question uh, why I chose this career uh, as a mechanical engineer, but I guess uh, that I, I was raised in a home um, that hard work uh, and to have uh, like a proper profession, uh, profession was very important. Both my parents um, came from uh, um, peripheral parts of, uh, of Israel, I can say, um, and they really Like in their environment, environment they really succeed thanks to um, education and thanks to the fact that they had professions. So this is the house that I was raised in. And although I, I wanted to go to study maybe history or literature, uh, but I had this buzz in my head about uh, having a proper profession. So I went to mechanical engineering. I was always good with science and physics and mathematics. I was a good student. Um, but then um, literature happened anyway, you know. It's now I have two careers. And now um, every day uh, I need to make that choice again. It's not uh, something very easy to hold two careers. Um, but uh, it had a very, very uh, um, fundamental effect on my writing because 
uh, my work and the idea of work and the effect of work uh, in my life, in our life, in this era, uh, is something very, very uh, strong in all my writing, in all my books. Um, so this is also something that happens. It's like a tension inside my, uh, my life and also inside my writing. Me pregunto si esa tensión tiene que ver con que la ingeniería mecánica, si tiene que ver con que la ingeniería mecánica es un, una profesión más eh, racional, más metódica, más organizada, y la escritura tiene, por supuesto que tiene organización, que tiene una dosis de racionalidad, pero también tiene mucho... Eh, trabajo con el misterio, con lo imponderable, con lo impredecible, con lo que irrumpe sin avisar. Eh, es una zona mucho más este, escurridiza. Quizás ahí está la tensión entre la ingeniera mecánica y la escritora. Mm. Um, yeah, this is a question that normally people ask me because it's very obscure to be both a writer and an engineer. But also, I think uh, in engi engineer the engineering uh, engineering is very wide, and also um, there is a lot of um, um, imagination in that too because it's um, you know it's very it's an an area that people invent things and solve problems and you need to think out of the box and you do have methodological I, I think I think that um, in order to sit and write you know to do the actual thinking the writing uh, my engineer helps me <laughs> to do the job you know to sit on the desk to desk to write to write and maybe on the the last part of uh, writing a book, editing it, uh, you know, going through all the edits and all the mistakes and um, missing uh, uh, punctuation or whatever. Uh, but um, in the writing itself, maybe it's better sometimes to forget uh, the engineering <laughs> side of me, the engineer side of me. Uh, but actually it's like two... Um, um, two monsters, I don't know, or two people inside me. Um, also, you know, we live in a very multidisciplinary uh, era when people are... Uh, I remember when I was a kid, people had um, a job and they worked in the job their whole lives. And if someone... Uh, switched jobs in the middle of his career. Uh, we even have a word for it in Hebrew. It's called uh, like a transition. He did a transition in order to change from a teacher to a sales uh, person or whatever. And today people do a lot of things, you know. Uh, you don't, it's, it's not such a big deal to, to change your job. So, um, and also we work a lot of hours, so uh, at least uh, I, had, I have an interesting mix of, uh, of a career. Yeah. Como prosista y también como poeta, te moves, me parece, por lo que leí en los bordes, ¿no? Y se percibe en, en tus libros un interés constante por el tema del trabajo y por cómo las mujeres trabajan en entornos masculinos. Y me pregunto, ¿de dónde viene ese interés? por los bordes y por el trabajo de las mujeres. Mm -hmm. Well, I think first of all it comes from uh, uh, my personal experience um, as a woman in uh, the engineering field, but also in the literary world. Uh, I think we are living in a very interesting uh, um, time in history. Uh, because women do have rights, uh, more rights than they had a uh, hundred years ago or fifty years ago, uh, and um, 
but still in Israel, and I think here too, I think all over the world, uh, women uh, earn less, uh, they have uh, more conflicts in, um, in the work environments, it's more likely for them to be harassed or um, not being promoted, not getting the raise. Uh, so um, I think it's something that uh, really bothers me. Um, and also, uh, yes, we're now in the Me Too era and all that, but I think that um, uh, it's very easy to read or uh, um, uh, give attention to things that happens uh, in uh, places of, like working environments that are um, uh, seen more, like in the entertainment world or in the newspaper, in the etc. But uh, in the like more unseen working environments, uh, factories, offices, uh, it's less seen and it's less noticed and it's less, less and less taken care of. So um, this is one side of it. And also, um, I was very interested in doing um, experiment, ex experimental writing in my, in, especially in my prose book, uh, uh, because uh, I, I, uh, I got to see, I got to read, and, and to see that a lot of times um, we meet we meet like the main character of the the novel, and this person is probably is a man, and he we don't know what he does for a living. It's like we never we don't know what he does like most of his, his days, uh, and um, sometimes these guys he goes back and forth in the city, and things happens to him in in at his house with his friends, but. We don't know how he get the money to pay the rent, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was very interest, interested in that. I, and and I, I asked myself what would happen if I would tell the story only in the area where he works. He will never be at home when I tell the story, when I talk about this person. And I, I put this limit uh, to myself, to limit myself to the area of his workplace. Um, and as a woman, I think uh, it's more interesting because um, for men, I mean, this world is tough for men too. And they're also suffering from uh, the patriarchy uh, and from chauvinism, from sexism. But for me, uh, it was more interesting to put a woman in this workspace. Uh, this is the um, reoccurring sentence in, in my book, a woman in workspace. Uh, because for women, I think workspace is still a non-resolved um, place, much more than for a man, yeah. Uh, Maybe I will shut it down every time I'm... Uh, okay. Ay. Tu primer libro es un libro de poemas que se llama Will Work Tomorrow. Es una colección de poemas publicados en 2014. Y me interesa saber qué encontraste en la poesía, en la forma del verso, en las formas breves, porque al menos los poemas... Este, Que, que vi, que leí, no son extensos, no son voluminosos. ¿La poesía quizás sea para vos como un laboratorio literario? Mm. Well, yeah, actually, I think, uh, well, my poetry book consists uh, also of very long poems that, let's say, more prosaic, uh, but they were not translated, <laughs> so he didn't receive them. But yeah, I think uh, poetry is, uh, for me, was like a kind of introduction for writing. Uh, in poetry, you normally write 
in the first uh, uh, in, in your name in the I you know and in the first person and also it has an opportunity it gives an opportunity to understand um, where you are where you stand um, and also you know I was always a uh, a fan of poetry, I always read poetry uh, since I was young. Um, it somehow felt more uh, um, natural, more organic. Um, but um, I was writing also stories um, at that stage and uh, Actually, m now it's very much mar more, more difficult to publish a book of poetry, uh, but uh, a book of, uh, of prose or fiction. It's like uh, somehow um, it feels like if you publish a book of, uh, of poetry, it has, you really, really have to say something important. Uh, it really has to, like, something really important happened in your, in your life uh, that you need to talk about it. I don't know. It's like I have this, how do you say, like, uh, I, have, I have, like, a book of poetry ready, a second book for maybe six years now and he's like waiting no it's let's wait let's wait for something to happen for something to happen i hope something good will happen and then not something bad yeah me impresiona mucho un poema que conocemos en español que se llama un día lo voy a leer y dice lo siguiente quisiera completar una frase que ya no me explique nada Quiero que se callen durante un día entero, que no digan nada, que hagan un ayuno de palabras, que el silencio se propague por las oficinas gubernamentales y que también los altos mandos se llamen a silencio. Susurrarán las hojas de los árboles tras las ventanas. Pido un día de relativa calma en las fronteras y en las paradas de los autobuses, sin piropos de camino a la playa, ni gritos para llamar la atención en los cristales del auto. Reunidas alrededor de las mesas, en las cocinas, las madres hablarán de política y las chicas reirán con las bromas de sus hermanas. Ustedes a cerrar el pico. Me parece, mi interpretación, que es un, un poema muy feminista, ¿no? Creo que le está diciendo a los hombres que hagan un ayuno de palabras, que cierren el pico. ¿Recordás en qué circunstancia concreta algo que escuchaste, viste, leíste, te impulsó a escribir este poema? Mm. Yeah, actually, it was a poem by an uh, uh, American uh, poet, uh, Collins. Uh, that he has a very, very uh, uh, strong image in that poem. Uh, I wish I would bring it with me, but he says there uh, that you shouldn't be surprised that uh, every time um, like uh, creatures from another world uh, land uh, in this uh, planet, Uh, the women stand uh, very, very strong with their hands on their, uh, on their chest, uh, like that. Um, and you only need to, to look at this woman uh, from our world, sitting at the table, um, like closing her mouth like that, uh, while she's listening to her husband, mansplaining the world to her. Something like that. I, I don't remember the exact poem by Billy Collins, but uh, it was very, very strong. And um, to read it, and it stayed with me for a long, for a long time. This image, and uh, and then you know, every every time, um, 
I mean, as a woman um, in in my workplace or in the street, uh, you are constantly. You know, I could answer this question with like. 2,000 different answers, because uh, every once in a while uh, a man feels like he needs to talk instead of me, or explain things to me, or uh, ex explain to me uh, something that I'm trying to explain to him better than me, you know? So, yeah, I think, yeah, I think men can be more humble and um, you know, give us uh, to talk uh, more. I mean, yeah. In order for someone to have the permission to talk more, someone else need to not talk. So, yeah. <laughs> it's not like I hate men, yeah. <laughs> han sido decisivas para vos? Mm. Yeah. Well, uh, there are some um, Hebrew uh, women poets that I really admire, um, like uh, Dalia Rabikovich and Yona Volach and uh, Vicky Shiran. Uh, I guess those names, uh, for most of you, uh, you're not fami familiar with them, but... Uh, in recent years, I really admire uh, some American poets uh, like Claudia Rankin. Uh, um, mm -hmm. I think that her book, Citizen, that uh, was published maybe eight years ago, uh, was one of the strongest uh, books that I've read ever in my life. Um, and yeah, there are some more, yeah. Uh, also writers, not only poets. And Natalia Ginsburg and Oli Kastelblum, uh, which also is a Hebrew, amazing Hebrew writer. Yes. Uh, in the water. Perdón, me olvidé de sacar. In the water is a novela gráfica, muy poética al mismo tiempo. Y ahora que lo pienso, Infancia de naranjas, que es un relato, tiene momentos también en que el relato deviene poema especialmente cuando aparecen los abuelos, la barba blanca del abuelo, la abuela Alicia o la abuela Rachel. ¿Cómo fue el pasaje de la poesía a la prosa? You mean uh, specifically in this book or in general? En general. In general. Yeah, I think it it was also very uh, natural uh, because uh, when I was writing, uh, when I published my uh, poetry book, I remember uh, one um, journalist said, I don't understand what is it, is it prose, is it poetry? And now, and, and then later, when I published the prose, people were, okay, so is this prose, is it poetry? So it's like... Uh, uh, moving from edge to an edge, you know, it's, uh, uh, and also um, the the structure that I, ro I wrote in, in both in the water and company is like very short fragments, uh, very loyal to uh, uh, rhythm and, and not only to narrative, actually very not loyal to narrative or uh, um, a very strict timeline of events, uh, much more uh, loyal to a voice. Uh, so in that aspect, I think there is poetry uh, in those books uh, still. And also I think poetry can be found in um, novels and novellas, uh, or maybe in newspapers sometimes. <laughs> Uh, only if you pay attention, you know, uh, some of my favorite uh, poem, poets are now novelists and they don't publish poetry anymore, and you, but you can find uh, their poetry um, in their novels, yeah, when you read slowly. A propósito de algo que escribió 
Namasal, escritora y editora de tu novela Company, que murió hace dos años en el ensayo La lengua que cayó, dice lo siguiente, la literatura no existe para contarnos historias, la literatura busca hacernos pensar sobre el modo en que nos contamos las historias. ¿Cómo experimentás desde la escritura ese modo de contar las historias? ¿Qué tipo de narradoras o narradores preferís en la prosa? ¿Qué puntos de vista te interpelan más? Bueno, creo que es una pregunta muy, muy buena. Y creo que es... Es la pregunta que me pregunto every time. I even think about starting a new book because uh, I can think about a great uh, idea for a story uh, or for a great uh, idea for a novel, a brilliant one, but it's not uh, good enough. Uh, the, the perspective and the point of view uh, uh, and also the structure is something that uh, really interests me. and. Uh, I think uh, the, the 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 thing is to um, to to interest myself in this process. Um, let's say uh, in company, uh, I was interested about this dual um, voice uh, that you are not sure who 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 is is, is she telling the story to. Is she telling it to herself? Or maybe uh, it is something, someone else standing outside the room? Uh, and in the novel that I already finished uh, to write, uh, it's about uh, a woman hunter in the US. Uh, she's an Israeli that goes to the US and uh, she's starting hunting animals, not people, uh, in the US. and. Uh, It's uh, it's something uh, that really plays on the relationship between the two countries and also about guns uh, and also about being a woman uh, in her 40s on the verge of not being fertile anymore and not having kids and trying to decide about it. But, uh, well... It sounds interesting, right? It's very intriguing. It, there's guns. It's a woman. Yeah. But also, I think what, what was interesting for me in that specific book was uh, why is she telling that story? Why is it so important for her to tell the story uh, in the first person? Who is she telling the story to? Um, well, I'm not going to answer these questions because then you maybe it will be translated one day and you can read it. I don't want to spoil it, but I think um, this is one of the uh, the questions that leads me is like, why uh, is this story told and to whom? Uh, yeah, this is like the two questions that interest me when I start. A propósito, de, a propósito de Company, hay una escritura muy fragmentaria, ya habías comentado que te gusta mucho escribir en fragmentos como muy intensos. Eh, yo la veo también como, como escritura de escenas, ¿no? de escenas casi teatrales, que combinan algo del de diario íntimo, el apunte narrativo y una escena teatral, ¿no? Eh, ¿Te costó encontrar esta forma en Company? ¿Necesitabas esta forma para, de alguna manera, desenmascarar el mundo corporativo y cómo impacta en el cuerpo de las mujeres ese mundo? Bueno, mm -hmm. well, um, yeah, este libro, en realidad, tenía mucho... Es muy corto but I worked on it for four years uh, and it, it went through um, some uh, phases, you know, changing it and... Uh, no, I, I, I really enjoyed writing it. Uh, it's, some of it is real, 
uh, is like uh, things that actually happened to me at work, and some of it no, not. Uh, but uh, I felt like it, like in in this specific book, uh, it's it was very important to be to me uh, for the this voice, this character that we don't really know what's her name is. Uh, she's a nameless uh, uh, protagonist, but it was very important for me to keep her very. Um, um, Cold, uh, in a sense, in the way she. Uh, um, it's not a reflex reflection. Uh, it's it's like she's reporting, she's reporting uh, her life or her work life uh, from from the desk of her work. She's just saying it in a very plain uh in a very plain uh, language uh and she's not um talking about feelings or uh, she doesn't uh, has like uh, she, of course she has an inner world and she has uh, maybe she has a therapist you know that she goes to when she has this this whole thing but <clears throat> i really wanted to uh have the sense of the language uh, of the workplace. And this was the language of the text. It's like bringing the language from <coughs> this work environments, which is like a language uh, which is uh, with English inside it, is with lingos from code writing or from machine, from uh, machine uh, language or machine building. And now it's, it's because it's in her language, it's in literature, it's in the text. Hay una frase que me impactó mucho dentro de la lectura de Company en un inglés que entiendo en general, pero este, vamos a ver si que condensa me parece que el daño que provoca el trabajo corporativo. Y la frase es la siguiente: oyes pero no escuchas. Existes, pero no entiendes. ¿Esa frase viene de algún testimonio, de la experiencia, de investigar e indagar en ese mundo? ¿Te la dijeron a vos? ¿La sentiste vos? Dijiste que había muchos elementos de la novela que eran reales. Yeah, I'm not sure if I understood the the question. Uh, you asked about a specific phrase or in general, uh, specifically. Uh, Sobre esa frase. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I feel I I, I, I like the, this uh, this part of the book is about this woman. Um, she works in a startup company, uh, and uh, this startup company uh, is going bankrupt. So the story uh, tells the story of that company going bankrupt, but also there is a voice uh, that comes and goes in and out of this woman in workspace. And these two women uh, have dialogue between them. Uh, the woman in the company that is going bankrupt and the woman in workspace. and. I am more more or less both. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I'm not sure if if I uh, I felt uh, not heard like you uh, quoted from uh, my text, uh, but I do know that sometimes, as uh, a lot of women, I prefer to not respond or to be quiet or. Um, to let some someone else to fight or to resist uh, if something happens, if someone says something out of line, or if someone is, uh, you know, um, yeah. But uh, the one of the opening scenes of uh, of the book is about this uh, um, CO. Uh, 
he jumps on the table and he talks uh, with the whole company while he's standing on the table uh, giving like a pep talk, you know, you need to work harder and all that. So that really happened to me. So this is like uh, some scenes that uh, came from real life. Of course, when you write it, it changes a bit, right? Uh, maybe it bec becomes uh, more theatralic. Uh, but sometimes, uh, no. Sometimes uh, reality is much more theatralic than uh, literature, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's very hard to write comedy today or uh, uh, caricatures uh, of politi politicians because they are the best caricatures of themselves, yeah. <laughs> <risa> Qué gran frase <risa> acaba de decir Teila. Hay, hay una, una frase que se me ocurre que tiene que ver con reinterpretar la famosa frase de Descartes que es leo, luego escribo. ¿no? Pienso que no, no se puede pensar la escritura sin la lectura. Eh, Sería como una especie de oxímoron, una escritora o un escritor sin lecturas o que lea poco, ¿no? Pero en esa trenza final que conforman la escritura, la práctica, la teoría, la lectura, me interesa saber cómo es el vínculo que tenés vos con la lectura y la escritura. Cuando escribís, ¿podés leer? ¿O la escritura en un estadio muy avanzado te exige exclusividad y no te permite leer? Yeah. yeah, I know that some writers cannot uh, read when they write, but uh, I, I read all the time. Uh, um, you do need to admit that sometimes it can go in, uh, like, uh, in, in inside and uh, be able to, you know, eliminate it or to see it, but uh, no. Um, even like in bed, well now because I'm tired of the evenings, you know, sometimes it's after half a page that I'm already asleep, but when I was not that tired in the evenings, uh, if I finish a book uh, in the night, I must start a new one because it's very hard to go to sleep <laughs> when you already know the end. So even to read just one page from another book or maybe two poems uh, of a book, but uh, yeah. ¿Qué libro, cuando lo leíste, te generó tanto entusiasmo que dijiste yo quiero hacer esto, yo quiero escribir y generar lo mismo que me, que me, que me generó esta lectura en los otros, en las otras? Yeah, th there are a few, um, but I think uh, actually there's one uh, Argentinian writer, young writer, uh, that I read a few years ago, uh, Pablo Kazachian. Uh, I, I said it correctly, his name? Kazachian. Kazachian. And he has a, a book uh, titled, uh, in Hebrew, Toda, Thanks. And... After I read it, I said, wow, uh, uh, it really, really affected me. And I think it also affected company in a way. Uh, um, but also uh, there is uh, one book of Natalia Ginsburg that really affected me. In Hebrew, it's uh, titled, uh, This is How It Happened. Um, Yeah, uh, it's a short novella and um, it's very strong. It's about a couple, uh, about their marriage. Uh, yeah, so, <clears throat> but there are many, there are many good books that I read uh, and also books that go with me a long way, uh, like Natalia Ginsburg's. Yeah. A propósito que mencionabas un escritor argentino, ¿Qué otras lecturas, eh, a partir de, de tu presencia acá en Buenos Aires, de, de escritores argentinos traducidos al hebreo, eh, has leído y qué te ha interesado de lo que leíste de la literatura argentina, ya sea más clásica o contemporánea? Mm -hmm. 
Well, you know, of course, uh, I read Borges and uh, Cortázar, um, and they are both brilliant. Um, but uh, we have a, a small publishing house in Israel uh, by an, uh, that was found, founded by an Argentinian uh, uh, Israeli that is originally Argentinian. His name is Uriel Kohn, and he brings a lot of uh, contemporary uh, uh, voices uh, of Argentinian writers. So I've read Ariana Horowitz, um, Die Mi Amor, and now also um, he translated a new one. In Hebrew, it's Megaret. Uh, I think it's maybe the Degenerate or something like that. Uh, um, and also uh, Anibal Kharkovsky, that I really love. He was, only one book of his was translated to Hebrew, but uh, uh, it's uh, excellent. So I think this is like um, the three names of um, like um, contemporary writing, I think, that I really love and admire. And uh, Actually, while we're speaking here, I, uh, they're translating more and more. So when I go back, I can read some more. <laughs> ¿Cómo está impactando la maternidad en tu escritura? La semana pasada eh, leíste un texto, Historia secreta de mi biblioteca, en el que comentabas que aparecían bebés todos el tiempo, ¿no? Eh, eh, últimamente, pero ¿qué otras cuestiones sentís que están cambiando? Por ejemplo, no sé, la respiración de tus textos es distinta. ¿Qué cambio notas desde que sos madre? Well, I think it changes. Uh, first of all, it's it changes um, the time you have and your attention um, like uh, before that before I had uh, Nuri my son uh, I could uh, sit and write for seven hours and forget about time and uh, and now it's not really possible uh, because in the house I hear him uh, and then it asks actually I think it the main question is like why am I doing it is it that important Uh, it's a bit, uh, there's something uh, that um, takes a bit uh, the floor underneath your uh, uh, feet. Mm -hmm. uh, like to ask that question again, um, like why am I writing? To whom am I writing? Um, but also um, I think Um, uh, I feel it like now uh, that I, re I, w I really want to uh, write something more, uh, I mean, less depressing. <laughs> uh, it's, not gonna, not like, it's not like I'm going to write a children's book now. I know that many writers that become parents uh, start to write for children suddenly. I'm not there, maybe yet, but I'm not there now. Uh, but I do feel like uh, I want to write something more uh, um, alive, like something more crazy, I don't know. Um, yeah. But also I'm a very young mom, I mean not in my age, but I'm only a year uh, a mother, so uh, it takes time um, to get back uh, to it. You know, um, to switch back to working mode, uh, uh, to get your language back. Um, yeah. Me gustaría saber qué estás escribiendo acá en, en, en la residencia. Si nos podés contar un poco de qué se trata la historia. Eh, y cómo está eh, ese texto, esa escritura, si, si la empezaste acá o, la, o, o vino con vos ese texto previamente, porque tenés experiencia en residencia, eh, estuviste en Iowa, 
este, en el 2018, creo, en Estados Unidos. Así que estás acostumbrada a, a la experiencia de ir por un mes o tres meses a un lugar a escribir, ¿no? Entonces, bueno, ¿qué, qué te trajiste a Buenos Aires o qué estás escribiendo en Buenos Aires? It's very hard to write here because you have an amazing city and it feels almost ridiculous to sit and write while the city happens outside. So you must send the writers to a very bad place <laughs> for three weeks and then to come here not to write, just to... <laughs> No, seriously, you know, because Iowa, okay, America, but it's like a small place. There's two streets, very lousy restaurants, <laughs> nothing to see. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, you live here. I'm only visiting. You know, it's an amazing city. I mean, wow. But uh, yeah, actually, I'm uh, I'm I'm, uh, I'm working on a short story uh, for an anthology of. Um, Uh, Israeli and Palestinian writers. This is something I am going to finish. Uh, um, it's sponsored by a forum of um, um, people uh, that lost their f beloved ones from both sides of the um, uh, occupation, uh, Israelis and Palestinians. So I'm writing something uh, experimental, uh, a very short story for that. Uh, but also, I was planning to start uh, working on a new novel. Um, and there, there is, there is a, um, a woman protagonist, and she's um, in her mid 40s. Uh, uh, she has a teenage uh, girl, and uh, she has an ex husband. He's a very nice man. He, her ex is like too nice. Uh, and, um, well, she's doing some online dating, uh, this woman, and uh, she's very bored. I don't know if any of you did online dating, but not not a very nice experience in general. But, um, I mean, it can be nice, but, you know. Uh, and she's very bored, so she decides that um, when she goes on a date, she's going to invent... Uh, uh, like invent a different kind of life for herself, like a different career uh, for herself, each time she goes on a date. And then um, one morning after one of these dates, um, she wakes up and so suddenly she's this person she invented uh, last night with the date. And it's like something, uh, yeah, I told you I want to write something crazy. So it's a bit of a crazy <laughs> idea. Uh, I don't know yet how she returns to her real life. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I think it's going to be funny. It's going to talk about work. Uh, there's a very uh, uh, interesting uh, nonfiction uh, book by uh, uh, David Graves. Uh, 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 he's a, I think, so sociologist or anthropologist, American. He died uh, last year. Uh, and his uh, book uh, is titled Bullshit Jobs. Uh, and it's about uh, um, jobs in our, uh, um, um, in, in this very hyper capitalist uh, world you are working in that are not really uh, fundamental. They're like jobs that people do and maybe they earn a lot of money or, but it's not very necessary, uh, these jobs. So I think this woman, she works now on this, one of those bullshit jobs. So it also talks about that, about uh, giving your life uh, to a job that actually does nothing, uh, nothing good to the world. So it's also about that. Bueno, estamos llegando un poquito al final. Yo tengo igual un par de preguntas, pero hago una más. Y en todo caso, me, me encantaría que abrir el diálogo para que ustedes también puedan preguntar o participar. Eh, en algún momento contaste que estabas escribiendo una novela sobre tres generaciones de mujeres. 
y que una de esas era tu abuela Lilla, que creo que es la que se aparece mencionada en Infancia de Naranja. ¿Qué pasó con esa novela? Porque me interesan las generaciones de mujeres y, y en Infancia de Naranja me enamoré de tus abuelas. <risa> Entonces, de curiosa, quiero saber si esa novela la avanzaste en la escritura, la terminaste, a ver si la vamos a poder leer finalmente eh, en inglés o en español, ojalá en castellano, ¿no? Sí. Yeah. Well, it's uh, an idea that I had, but actually it changed a bit, and I wrote a novella uh, that it's not uh, exactly there, but uh, it's an idea that still sits uh, in the back of my mind, and maybe I will return uh, there someday. Maybe this woman will have a grandmother. Uh, well, no, I think it's a different story. <laughs> I will have to give it for the next one, if I will have the opportunity to write another one. Y cierro mi pregunta, ¿qué importancia tuvo para vos tus abuelas en tu vida? Well, um, my uh, grandmother for my mother's side, she died in, when I was in a very early age, uh, I was six. And my other grandmother, uh, Rachel, um, I knew her for a long time. She passed when I was in my early 20s. But actually, it was, um, I mean, I felt very loved by my grandparents and um, I feel very attached to them, but in the same uh, time, Uh, both my grandparents were immigrants, and uh, they didn't uh, speak Hebrew very well. And uh, I mean, my mother parents, uh, my mother was born in Morocco, and uh, uh, so they talked uh, at home um, the Moroccan uh, Arabic. <clears throat> and my father's family immigrated from Iran, so they talked um, Persian, uh, Farsi. So all those languages are languages that I never spoke. So the communication with them was very uh, limited to uh, words and touch of affection and less uh, conversations or, you know, dialogue. Uh, so I think Because of that, maybe I'm very much drawn uh, into both their stories. And also, I think we were talking uh, earlier about feminism, uh, and <clears throat> I know that both of them, uh, they are were really uh, heroes in my uh, point of view because they had to go through. Uh, so many um, bad, bad uh, life experiences. Um, and yeah, so I'm, I'm very interested in finding the right time um, to write about them or to reflect the way I feel about them. Uh, yeah. My, uh, my, I have a twin sister, and she's an amazing artist. And she just did a beautiful uh, exhibition in Tel Aviv Museum. If you visit Tel Aviv, it will be until October uh, on. Uh, and she actually, it's, uh, her exhibition is titled Looking for a Village. Uh, because the village of my uh, grandparents uh, from Morocco, it's no longer there. It's, ex it's not existing anymore. It's vanished. After the Jewish uh, uh, people left the village, it, it, it vanished completely. And in her exhibition, uh, she went looking for uh, that village uh, through um, photography. Uh, and I, I wrote uh, the text for her uh, exhibition. Um, actually, Her exhibition started from a text that I wrote about it, about 
uh, looking for that place, but in the same time looking for my grandmother, uh, looking for um, a way to understand her, to know her, uh, because I felt like I never knew her. Uh, yeah. ¿Cuál es el nombre de la ciudad? It's called Asamir. It's in the high Atlas uh, mountains of Morocco. Yeah. It's a small village. Uh, and after the Jewish community, very small community left, uh, immigrated most of them to Israel, mm -hmm. uh, not staying there. Yeah. So, yeah. Finished. Thank you. Bueno, podemos hacer preguntas. Quieren. Yo me acerco, si no, el micrófono. Les a ver un segundito. Ahí veo una manito alzada. Ahí voy yo. A ver. Ahora paso a. Hi, Hebrew, English. <laughs> uh, do you have your books uh, in ebooks too? Um, yes, there are in Hebrew. <laughs> I don't ah, in have Hebrew a, or I don't in, have in a Kindle story in Hebrew or not in English or. I don't have a full book uh, published in English yet. Ah, okay. uh, I do have some uh, stories in anthologies or poems. Uh, there are e-books of my books in Hebrew, if you read in Hebrew. Uh, but I, I hope that uh, it will be published soon, <laughs> somewhere. Maybe in Spanish, I don't know. <laughs> ¿Alguna pregunta más? ¿Alguien quiere hacer alguna pregunta? Sí, ahí voy. No, you mentioned uh, an American writer that you were fond of. I was trying to write it down. The poet? Yes. Claudia Renkin. Ah, Claudia you. Renkin, yes. I saw, I saw her. Yeah, Renkin. I saw actually her book in uh, Spanish in one of the stores. She, I'm sure she was translated. She's very, very good. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Are you enjoying being here? Yes, too much. <laughs> It's like a dream because uh, Magdalena said that when uh, I received this beautiful uh, uh, residency, it was two years ago, and actually I can't believe I'm here still, you know? <laughs> I mean, we made all the way the flight with the baby and everything, but still I'm not sure that I'm really here. I need to... <laughs> yes. Walking... Uh, on uh, Jorge Luis Borges Street to Cortazar Plaza, and cannot believe it's happening to me. <laughs> and Mafalda, of course, yeah. Mafalda. ¿Alguna pregunta más? ¿Alguien se anima? ¿En qué edad empezó a escribir? ¿La escuchaste? ¿En, a, a, qué, ¿A qué edad empezó a escribir? ¿A qué edad empezaste a escribir? Preguntan. Again, I'm. Uh, ah, ok. Yeah, I, I started writing uh, in a very young age, I think, maybe uh, in my teenage uh, years, but uh, I didn't, uh, you know, uh, refer to myself as a writer back then. Uh, I, I first published uh, in my uh, early 30s, like uh, 10 years ago. Uh, yeah, 10 years ago, exactly. I, I published some poems. Um, Yeah, so this is when I started, you know, maybe referring to myself as a writer after starting publishing. Yes. Hola, shalom. Shalom. Bueno, mi nombre es Daniela. Gracias. Eh, yo ahora estoy traduciendo la poesía de Yona Balag al castellano, así que me pone muy contenta que la hayas mencionado como influencia. Eh, y bueno, ya que te tengo acá, aprovecho a preguntarte si tenías alguna recomendación o, no sé, algunas palabras acerca de ella. Bueno, you know, Yona Volaj es uno de los más prominent uh, poets uh, of, let's say, the modern uh, Hebrew poetry. 
Uh, and of course, because she was a woman uh, poet, uh, she was referred to a bit uh, like she's a crazy woman and stuff like that. But actually, she was absolutely brilliant. Uh, and I think she was also uh, early of her times because she wrote, I mean, in Hebrew, you have the body in the language. When you speak, um, when you um, write as a female or as a male, it's, you can see, yeah? It's, uh, you have the body of the person in the eye, in the first person. And she uh, uh, played with that uh, uh, idea. Uh, sometimes a, a man, sometimes a woman. And for that uh, time, it was very uh, outrageous, you know? It was um, very modern, uh, very uh, non-conventional, and also um, um, she was very political, uh, and she talked about um, sex. And you know, Israel, Israel is a, a very uh, Puritan uh, society, very uh, modest, and uh, the family uh, a value is a very important thing, and people do not talk about sex. I mean, not back then, and today not so, too. So she's very important, she's very interesting, and completely brilliant. Yeah. I, I agree. <laughs> sí, me pasa lo mismo. Siento que es muy actual y, y me sorprendió mucho como investigando eh, ver que a pesar de que ella escribía en los 60s, en los 80s, por ejemplo, eh, no está traducida al castellano, o sea, no tiene el libro. Y a mí eso me sorprendió un montón. Como para mí es como si fuera la pizarnik de Israel, por ejemplo. Es como tendría que existir en todos los idiomas. Así que, bueno, ojalá pronto termine este trabajo y pueda compartir con ustedes. Gracias. Bueno, no sé si hay alguna pregunta más. ¿Alguien se anima? ¿No? Bueno, eh, yo lo disfruté mucho. Eh, fue un placer este, compartir esta, esta charla, este diálogo con Teila, con muy ustedes. Dulce, sí. <ríe> muy dulce. <ríe> Thank you. Así que ahora lo que queremos es, yo quiero decir algo y me parece que la importancia de este programa es que eh, en el caso de escritores que no son de nuestra lengua es poder... Eh, que la visita y además de lo que ellos, de que les permitan escribir, es poder conocer su obra, que, que esto abra la puerta a la traducción de sus libros. Me parece que el programa es como una puerta, o si quieren la metáfora de las ventanas que se abren para que lleguen los libros de Teila al castellano, los esperamos con ansiedad, ¿no? Así que bueno, muchas gracias, un aplauso. Bueno. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.